afternoon and welcome to the final 2021 installment of the Adrian Arsh Latin America Centers Leaders of the Americas series, where today we will focus on US Caribbean relations heading into the new year. I am Melanie Chen, a board member at the Atlantic Council and the founder of the Center's Caribbean Initiative launched this past year. I'm delighted that we are joined today by a distinguished guest and leader in the Caribbean, the Honorable Gaston Brown, Prime Minister of Antigua and Barbuda, who's also the current chair of the Caribbean community. We also have behind the scenes, Ambassador Ronald Sanders, who's the Dean of the CARICOM Ambassadors. We welcome you both, Prime Minister, welcome, and we are honored to have you join us. Mr. Prime Minister, in February, we started the initiatives programming with then chairman of CARICOM, the Honorable Keith Rowley, Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago. It is only fitting that we end the year with you, CARICOM's current chair. As our audience knows, even prior to your post as CARICOM chair, you have championed Caribbean issues on regional and international stages. The Prime Minister is CARICOM's lead on financial services, which has included working with US policymakers to address the effects of de-risking in the Caribbean, an issue that the Caribbean Initiative is currently tackling. As a regional leader, Prime Minister Brown quickly called on international institutions and richer countries to support equitable vaccine access for all developing nations. His words, along with other Caribbean leaders, resonated deeply with us and inspired our campaign on the, the strategic importance of sending US vaccines to the Caribbean, including a report launched in June. On that note, we encourage all eligible persons to get vaccinated as soon as possible if you've not already done so. At the recently concluded COP26, Prime Minister Brown led the charge for increased finance to address the devastating effects of climate change on small island and low-lying coastal states. A deeper US partnership with CARICOM is increasingly vital as we look to tackling the many challenges and opportunities that are ahead. With that, it's my pleasure to invite those watching to tweet about the event with the hashtag ACCaribbean and to turn the program over to Prime Minister Brown, who will provide opening comments. He will then have a conversation with the director of the Adrian Arsht Latin America Center, Jason Marzak. Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Malani. And I acknowledge all of the other distinguished um, panelists and certainly thank all of the members of the um, Atlantic Council uh, for the opportunity to talk to you and at the same time to thank you on behalf of the Caribbean people for your advocacy, for the role you'd have played to help us to amplify our voice, not only in the United States, but um, throughout the globe as we seek to address a number of challenges affecting the Caribbean people. And as you're fully aware, we are all part of um, the same hemisphere and there's a need for us to improve and expand or strengthen the bilateral and multilateral relations between the United States and the Caribbean region. So I'm hoping that at the end of um, this dialogue that um, we will come up with certain strategies as to how there could be uh, greater cooperation between the United States and the Caribbean region. Now we are coming to the end of what has been a very difficult two-year period for all of um, CARICOM in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. The effects of the pandemic have cost us hundreds of human lives and hundreds of millions of dollars in expenses in our response to the pandemic. In fact, we have had to divert um, funding for development in order to fund associated expenses um, in our response to the pandemic. We recognize that um, we're not unique to the impact of COVID on lives or even on livelihoods, but perhaps the economic impact created by COVID among Caribbean states, especially the uh, tourism dependent states like Antigua and Barbuda is far more acute than in other developing countries. We also acknowledge that through agile responses by our health services, 
and by spending very scarce revenues to build up health services. The majority of CARICOM countries manage the health challenges of the pandemic much better than, I'd say, other parts of the world. Uh, we suffered, of course, from the lack of direct access to the major pharmaceutical companies to purchase the vaccines, uh, having been crowded out by the richest countries, uh, which bought and stockpiled vaccines, leaving other countries with little or nothing. Many um, uh, CARICOM leaders, including myself, uh, we prevailed upon the President of the United States to donate vaccines to us that would otherwise have had to be discarded because they're expiring. And again, I just want to thank you uh, for literally following on the call that was made by many of us in the Caribbean, including um, former Chairman um, Prime Minister Keith Rowley. And obviously, um, with your support, the United States um, responded um, and we have been able to literally um, um, acquire vaccines, which, have, which has placed us in a better place. Uh, because otherwise, in that, I believe that we would have had far more deaths within the region, and even the economic carnage would have um, been more acute. But we have not yet reached herd immunity or community immunity in most of our countries. And we still need vaccines, even as we are contending with the same phenomenon of um, vaccine resistance that exists elsewhere. And I'm sure you would recognize too in the context of the new Omicron virus that we are variant, that we need to acquire more vaccines so that we can um, pursue booster shots for those who would have um, been vaccinated at least, at least six months ago. So acquiring um, vaccines continue to be a significant requirement for the Caribbean region. Even um, acquiring vaccines for our youth, those who are under 11 um, years of age. I do not believe that any of the CARICOM countries have been able to access any of those vaccines to date. So we still have a large cadre of our youth who are unprotected. On the economic front, and apart from Guyana, whose oil and gas discoveries and ex exploration um, are literally transforming um, its economy, the other countries of CARICOM have been hard hit with economic losses as high as 20% of GDP. And that is no exaggeration. I mean, we have had countries within the region that have actually lost over 20% of the economy in a given year as a result of COVID. Uh, the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean has indicated that the economic effects of the pandemic have already caused us to lose a decade in development. Now, that is a real troubling issue for most of us here in the Caribbean. And I don't know that we could wait for an entire decade to recover those lost gains. Evidently, we'll require the assistance of the United States and other countries, other developed countries, in order to um, recover those lost gains within the shortest um, period of time. Now, our first priority and our biggest immediate challenge is economic rebuilding and recovery. We recognize that um, our march to economic recovery will be protracted, but we believe that with some level of support from the US and other um, developed countries that we can actually cut that timeline and perhaps maybe within the next two, three years, we'd we'll be able to um, recover our, our economies in the interest of all, especially for future generations. Because if the recovery is um, protracted, then we will end up with some structural problems that will go beyond that decade. And it is important that you know, we get the necessary assistance now to avoid um, you know, those structural problems that could um, persist for decades to follow. Now, uh, it will call for access to financing on affordable terms. I mean, our biggest issue is funding at this point. I mean, our economies have been decimated and we need access to affordable financing. In fact, the region at this time is literally facing a debt crisis. I mean, most countries as a result of um, COVID, they now have debt to GDPs uh, over 90%, uh, some in excess of 100%. And you would know that at that level of debt to GDP, that it is certainly unsustainable. And the only workable solution 
is for debt rescheduling and some level of um, debt forgiveness to bring that debt to GDP within a manageable space so that these countries um, can continue to meet their obligations, especially their developmental obligations um, you know, to their people. Now, currently, the only source of concessional financing available to a number of countries um, within the region, at least those countries that are not considered to be either countries, is from China. Uh, China has extended developmental loans up to 20 years at 2% with a five-year principal uh, repayment moratorium. Now, that is the, the type of funding that we need in order to continue to grow and develop. And truth be told, that requirement existed even prior to COVID. Because prior to COVID, a number of Caribbean countries had very high debt to GDP ratios, ratios or high debt to GDP ratios, and would have been in need of um, you know, more long-term funding. Now, these superior terms that are offered um, by China obviously would have endeared a number of Caribbean countries to pursue loans from the People's Republic of China because they're even superior to the international financial institutions, which incidentally are uh, locked in this outmoded, outmoded and unresponsive um, policy space. And they continue to disqualify countries such as Antigua and Barbuda from access to grants and concessionary, concessionary financing because of the application of the single and the wrongful criterion of per capita income. And we all know that the per capita income criteria, and it is backward looking. It tells you what the situation was years before. I mean, when you look at our situation, for example, that um, leading up to COVID, uh, Antigua and Barbuda had a per capita income of about 19,000 US dollars per head. But we have lost 20% of that. And these institutions are not even taking that into consideration. They are looking backwards, and their position is that you know, you had a per capita income criterion of, um, uh, sorry, per capita income of 19,000 US per head, and therefore you are in ineligible. When Antigua and Barbuda, for example, has been perhaps one of the worst affected um, countries by COVID because, you know, we are tourism dependent, one of the most tourism dependent countries in the world. So this criterion fails to take into account a number of factors, at least two that are listed now. Uh, firstly, Caricom economies are uh, open economies. Uh, they import costs and inflation from their trading partners, especially the US. And in order to meet these high costs in a democracy where human rights are respected and upheld, governments have to respond to the cries of um, workers for increased wages to buy increasingly costly imports. And the situation now with the logistics chaos and the increase in um, food prices and other commodities, I mean, this situation is one that we're faced with at this time. Now, the alternative is to deny human and civil rights by repressing trade unions and people representation, which we cannot do. But we want to point out to this um, distinguished um, forum that democracy and human rights are not achieved in conditions of poverty and want. They cannot, certainly democracy and human rights, they cannot thrive in conditions of poverty and want. Uh, these are issues that have to be addressed in order to sustain um, democracies within the Caribbean region. Secondly, because all Caribbean, Caribbean countries, or at least Caribbean countries, encourage foreign investment, the income of their owners or the owners of these investments and the senior managers, um, they have actually skewed the per capita income of the country, resulting in 85% to maybe 90% of the highest um, income going only to 10% of the wage earners. Now, since most Caribbean countries are classified as upper middle income or high income countries on a per capita basis, they are forced to finance their developmental needs, including rebuilding after disasters on commercial terms, and in many instances at very high rates of interest. I mean, I've known countries that have borrowed as high as 14% per annum, and that is not an exaggeration. This in turn increases um, their debt burden and reduces their fiscal space for investment in the productive areas of the economies and in welfare projects uh, for the poor and vulnerable. The US has a strong voice within the 
four walls of the IFIs and its intervention for the implementation policies that take um, account of the vulnerability and on the development of CARICOM countries would be a game changer in terms of access to finance. This is an area in which we think the United States has failed to assist the Caribbean region to use its um, influence within the IFIs to have more responsive, um, uh, let's say, policy instruments and um, financial tools to assist countries in the Caribbean. And again, even in terms of the per capita income, I mean, we would have loved to see a situation where the U.S. help us to champion the um, development of a multidimensional vulnerability index uh, which will replace the unjust per capita income criterion. This would allow for more inclusivity instead of eliminating vulnerable countries from much needed developmental assistance. I mean, when you look at a small state um, in the Caribbean that could be decimated by a hurricane and you know the country is not generating any income or income would have um, fallen significantly, you know, how can you use a, an artificial criterion to say to that country that you cannot assist? I think there's just something immoral about that type of behavior. And we need to have um, more responsive um, policies um, from the international financial institutions. And at the same time, they should be looking at the vulnerability of these countries and not to be utilizing the per capita income criterion, which in itself is backward looking. I mean, it looks back at um, dated um, figures and does not take into account the current realities to include the vulnerability of the country. At the bilateral level, the United States can help by reviewing its policies and certain positions that it would have taken that in essence would have um, hurt Caribbean countries. Among those policies and positions are uh, ones reflected in the US State Department's annual International Narcotics Control Strategy Report or the INSA report that they make to Congress uh, on an annual basis. And this is an exaggeration. The time and you know, information that has not been verified, literally uh, flawed information that may be in the public space. In many instances, um, information put out by irresponsible opposition elements that would end up in the INSA report without any validation. And, uh, you know, that type of behavior obviously creates a problem for Caribbean countries. I mean, for several years, the report branded um, literally every Caribbean country as a major money launderer, making um, all countries in the Caribbean vulnerable to what is called um, the risking by US banks, uh, which fear that the provision of corresponding banking relations to Caribbean banks uh, would put them, you know, at risk of hefty fines for money laundering. But when you look at the stats, when you look at the data, you'd recognize that there's no way uh, certain countries uh, within the region could be money laundering havens. I mean, we have had countries, for example, that have less than a billion US dollars in total assets, offshore assets. And if you, even, even if you take into consideration the domestic banking assets, uh, most of the countries within the OECS Caribbean, for example, they have less than maybe two and a half billion US dollars in total assets with all of the banks onshore, offshore. So this notion that there could be billions of dollars or maybe trillions of dollars hidden uh, within these um, economies is virtually impossible. The data does not bear out that type of um, allegation. Now, it is not ready, though, that over the decade between 2008 and um, 2018, uh, there were $26 billion in fines imposed on banks for non-compliance. Uh, the U.S., however, accounted for 91% of the fines, or $23.5 billion, followed by Europe with $1.7 billion, and the rest of the world accounted for about $0.6 million. That includes the CARICOM um, countries, which obviously is one of the smallest groups. Now, what is significant is that none of these prosecutions involve any entity loco located in the Caribbean community. And that is because those monies are not stored here. And what you'll find too, is that even those small banks, offshore banks that we have within the region, the monies are not banked in the Caribbean. The monies are banked in North America and Europe. 
so that um, at the end of the day, those funds are not here. And so this notion that the money is just stashed away in the Caribbean is not correct because these banks generally, generally they prefer to keep their assets in hard currencies, um, in euros, in um, US dollars, Canadian, and uh, even sterling. Uh, so, you know, perhaps the policymakers in the US, they need to have a better exam, a better understanding as to what is happening within the industry because when they take certain decisions, um, you know, obviously there's some unintended um, consequences uh, for Caribbean countries, which in essence are uh, undermining our development. Now, within the Caribbean um, region, the banks here only account for about 1% of all global transactions. And if you only account for 1%, then how could there be so much money laundering within the region? As I said, the data does not support the allegation. Now, the only the tiniest and perhaps slightest risk to the global system would exist uh, within um, the banks operating within the Caribbean region because of the small volume of um, transactions and the small asset base of these banks. And when you look at our domestic banks, for example, uh, in terms of um, wire transfers, I mean, of the largest commercial bank operating here in Antigua, for, as an example, I doubt they have maybe more than two dozen um, wire transfers taking place on a daily basis. So the transaction volumes are so small that, that it is easily to um, identify, you know, those transactions that may be associated with um, narco trafficking or uh, let's say even terrorism financing. And so far, there hasn't been any um, evidence of any terrorism financing emanating from out of um, the CARICOM space. Now, again, as I said, the risk here, they are just minuscule. And factually, the majority of Caribbean countries are more in compliance with financial um, or the financial action task force rules on disclosure of beneficial owners of bank accounts, corporations, and trusts than any other state within the U.S., in Europe for that matter. And that's a fact that was recently acknowledged by um, uh, Janet Yellen, your U.S. Um, uh, secretary, uh, Treasury Secretary. Now, the U.S. should review and you know, revisit um, its reports, uh, which falsely label CARICOM countries as major money launderers, uh, which would have over the years caused U.S. banks uh, to become fearful of providing in corresponding banking relations to respondent banks in the Caribbean. And that in itself would have created some fundamental problems. In fact, what has happened now, I mean, our res uh, respondent banks, they are so conservative now, so fearful of losing their U.S. corresponding banking relations that commerce has literally, you know, come to a halt because the policies that they have introduced here they they are extremely conservative and um you know the due diligence process you know takes um in some instances weeks so to do the ordinary uh, transfer routine transfers um, it takes days to effect um these transfers and that in itself is literally put in the caribbean region at a competitive um, disadvantage when you know citizens in europe in North America, they can literally walk into a bank and effect a transaction almost instantaneously. So that is a problem in terms of our competitiveness and in order to attract investments, if um, that is gonna be the type of framework in which our respondent banks you know, are gonna to continue to operate, then clearly the Car Caribbean region will not be a priority for investments. So the risking therefore is an urgent area uh, that would like US financial the regulators to revisit and uh, we are certainly looking forward to your report um, in January on the issue of um, the risking and again we just want to thank you uh, the members of the um, council for the work that you've done in lobbying um, the various um, you know congressmen and congresswomen and then again we would have had some assistance from um, congresswoman um, Maxine Waters on that issue and whereas I do acknowledge that the risking has slowed, it, it still represents a significant threat. Now, the second priority that CARICOM faces in 2022 and beyond is dealing with the issue of climate change. Uh, notwithstanding the impact of COVID, uh, climate change represents the most significant risk to the CARICOM region. The United States remains the world's second greatest um, 
emitter of um, CO2 after China. And all of the countries in CARICOM collectively, uh, they emit no more than 0.1% of all greenhouse gases. But as you know, we suffer disproportionately, even though we're the least um, generators of um, climate change. And we're among the first and the most affected. Over the last um, five decades, as um, catastrophic um, events have increased in frequency and intensity, CARICOM countries have been among the worst affected. I mean, we have had to rebuild year after year. We have had to borrow repeatedly to repair damage infrastructure. I mean, many of our countries have no access to concessionary financing at the IMF or the World Bank. So we have to borrow in commercial terms. And uh, what that would have done um, by borrowing in commercial terms to finance rebuilding, it would have added to the burden of our debt and would have created um, an unsustainable um, level of debt. So it's a double whammy. And now that we only am um, suffering from the effects of um, climate change, uh, and, and I have to say here in the Caribbean, uh, we're literally suffering from all of the effects of climate change, everything you can think about. I mean, even your melting glaciers that um, you have in temperate countries, when your glaciers melt, um, it actually increases um, sea level rise, and then we lose parts of our coast. Now, our coastline, in fact, one of our best beaches in Antigua, Dickinson Bay, we have lost a part of it as a result of um, rising sea level. We've had heat waves, we have droughts, and when it does rain, we end up with floods. We have seen more frequent um, and ferocious hurricanes. Uh, even our animals and um, you know, plants, I mean, our crops have been affected by um, climate change. So whereas the Caribbean region easily is one of the most beautiful regions in the world, climate change has made the Caribbean area a very difficult area in which to live through no fault of ours, through perhaps a little contribution of ours in terms of um, the use of fossil fuel energy. Uh, so this is a serious issue for us. You know, it's an issue of um, life and death. And we are hoping that we can see a little more empathy and a little more action coming from the United States. Because at the end of the day, um, you too, you have a number of um, coastal areas and practically every year, the United States uh, um, gets hit by a, a hurricane. But, I mean, you're far more resilient. You have trillions of dollars in resources and you're able to recover. The problem that we have here is that we just do not have the capacity um, to recover quickly or to even build a type of resilient climate infrastructure in order to mitigate against the um, ravages of um, climate change. You know, so these are some of the issues that um, we have to um, contend with. And um, it's not the polluter who is paying here. What is happening is that the victim, you know, is called upon to pay. And again, we're carrying the burden of um, all of the physical damages of climate change, the psychological damages, um, the um, effects on um, our food security and our food sovereignty. And at the same time, we have to go and borrow at um, commercial terms in order to rebuild. There's just something extremely unjust about that situation. And, you know, we're happy that we have this opportunity that we could have a frank discussion and to bring these issues to your attention. Thank you, no. Mr. Mr. Prime Minister. Maybe I'll, maybe that's a great point for me to me to jump in here and, and to uh, thank you uh, for your excellent comments and, and remarks. Uh, again, I'm Jason Marzak. I'm director of the Adrian Arts Latin America Center. I'm thrilled to be able to uh, engage you further in some of the comments uh, you've made, Mr. Prime Minister. You've touched so many issues uh, in your opening comments that really, I think, quickly show your your leadership and your foresight. Uh, on what's needed for the Caribbean, uh, Caribbean growth, Caribbean resilience, uh, and also your perspective that comes, the unique perspective that comes with leadership of a small state uh, in, in the Caribbean. Uh, as you mentioned at the Caribbean issue, we're in the, at the Asian Arts Latin America Center, we're very focused on tackling many of the issues you touched on, climate change, de-risking, and the importance of the Caribbean for the United States and the broader hemisphere's uh, prosperity. We're working to raise these priorities uh, here in Washington. Uh, I want to also invite those who are watching, uh, feel free to use the Q&A function if you're watching via Zoom to submit a question. If you're watching via live stream on Twitter, you can use the hashtag AC Caribbean. But Mr. Prime Minister, I want to start with asking you, you laid out a number of issues in your opening comments uh, from COVID, uh, the economic implications of COVID, health implications, de-risking, uh, climate change, uh, 
Uh, also, you mentioned a couple different ways in which you would like to see even greater partnership uh, with the United States uh, on some of these issues. Uh, let me start by drilling down a, a little bit on uh, beginning with COVID, uh, since it's uh, so acute. What, what additional help um, the U.S. has provided vaccines uh, 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 beginning uh, mid-year? Uh, you mentioned the challenge for more vaccines, including for youth uh, in the Caribbean. What, what additional help uh, optimally would you see from the United States with regard to the health recovery from COVID uh, in 2022? All right. So as I said before, we need more vaccines um, for the uh, children on 11 um, years of age uh, and also for booster shots. And, um, you know, this is something can, that can be done easily, um, especially with um, vaccines that may be expiring. Uh, we also need um, more therapeutics, at least access to them. And, you know, the problem is, you know, we not, we're not getting the access. Otherwise, you know, we would have paid for them. So in the absence of that, we're asking the United States to make um, some more vaccines and some of those um, therapeutics, um, including the Pfizer um, pills that could help with the hospitalizations and possible um, uh, fatality of um, uh, COVID patients. We also need more um, test kits. There are some countries that require, um, you know, some more PPEs and even oxygen. I mean, you've had um, countries in the Caribbean that were literally on the verge of um, running out of um, oxygen. And I want to thank the U.S. for the field hospitals that they've extended to a number of Caribbean countries. There may still be a few that are uh, in need of field hospitals. And one of the areas in which I think the U.S. Um, can help, and this, uh, you know, perhaps a novel idea is to um, have a, a robust nursing program under the U.S. Title IV to um, train more nurses because um, we, found, we found, for example, in Antigua and Barbuda, our nurses are tired. I mean, they have been laboring for almost two years. And uh, we think that by um, having a strong nursing program where we can um, use our surplus labor to develop more nurses for the benefit of the Caribbean people and even for the U.S., that, that could be a mutually beneficial program. And Antigua and Barbuda, for example, is prepared to utilize its um, campus at Five Islands to assist in developing that program and which will attract students from throughout the Caribbean, train them as nurses, and many of whom will um, redeploy to the United States to help you with your nursing shortage. And of course, there's always a requirement by Caribbean countries to um, get technical assistance and even funding to expand um, their healthcare infrastructure. Fantastic. Let me go to you also mentioned with regard to COVID and the implications. Uh, you spoke uh, uh, about the economic impacts of, of COVID and the, 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 uh, specifically that the economic impacts of COVID are more acute uh, in the Caribbean given the dependence of uh, tourism economies. You mentioned that losses are as high as 20 percent uh, of GDP uh, and, and the challenges with uh, a potential debt crisis and, and the need for affordable uh, financing. Uh, what other ways do you see uh, opportunities uh, for the U.S. to deepen its partnership with the Caribbean in the economic recovery, uh, especially for uh, countries like your own and, and those others in the Caribbean that are uh, so tourism dependent, as you mentioned, that are uh, particularly suffered uh, due to the uh, pandemic and the withdrawal of tourism? Well, you know, the issue of debt, unsustainable debt is one of the major problems um, facing the Caribbean region. And um, even after we get um, COVID um, under control, there will be an unsustainable debt. So I believe the United States could help us um, with um, some level of um, debt relief, even open up the doors for us at the Paris Club so that we can um, address the bilateral debts with the developed countries and to get um, some restructuring uh, debt relief. Uh, as I said before, the... Um, uh, assistance in development of a multi-dimensional vulnerability index uh, so that we can become um, uh, eligible or those countries that are excluded can become eligible um, for ODA. And um, we also have the view to that the U.S. can help us by reducing its emissions so that um, the region can be you know, um, less vulnerable to the effects of um, climate change. Uh, outside of that, um, you know, there are many areas of assistance that are required, um, building um, capacity in various areas, even um, acquiring technology. Uh, 
And um, the year of the risking, we would have um, exhausted that. Um, that's an area in which uh, the U.S. could um, easily um, assist us by removing that existential threat uh, that has literally created a, created a problem um, for us. Um, and I think that by addressing these issues, um, the U.S. can help to, um, uh, let's, let's say, reduce the threats of um, job losses, of increased poverty and so on, and uh, even they can provide technical assistance to help us divide, diversify our economies. Because, as I said before, the Caribbean region, you know, most of the countries are tourism dependent. And as a consequence, the fallout, economic fallout would have been greater than other places um, in the world. And uh, I'm hoping that at some point we could have some form of um, institutionalized dialogue on a regular basis the United States between CARICOM and the U.S. so that we can have, um, you know, deeper discussions as to how we can collaborate and at the same time to discuss areas of um, capacity building to include um, capacity building in um, science and technology. You mentioned, Prime Minister, you mentioned, and you've done so much work on the issue of, of, of de-risking and, and the implications uh, the, which of the withdrawal of correspondent banking relations. It's one of the most challenging problems faced in the Caribbean it's one in which many people uh, frankly are, are not that aware of, uh, except for those people who most acutely see the, the challenges of, of de-risking cuts off the region from global financial system, limiting access to trade, credit, finance, among other issues. Can, I'd like for you to elaborate a little bit more, especially because it's uh, such an uh, important issue for the Caribbean initiative here at the Atlantic Council, financial inclusion writ large across the Caribbean and de-risking being part of that. How how has this how has that withdrawal relations affected the Caribbean the Caribbean as a whole, uh, and also how does it uh, affect the Car people in the Caribbean on, on, a, on a day to day basis and, and that relationship then with the United States? Well, you know, corresponding banking is a global public good, and when you um, tinker with it and you literally debank countries and regions. Uh, you create a problem in which they cannot uh, make or receive payments. And by so doing, um, you know, it results um, in business closures, in um, job losses, increased poverty. And that is precisely what has happened uh, within the Caribbean region. So, for example, um, the region would have diversified into offshore banking um, for several decades. It was one of the areas that provided a significant amount of um, employment. And within the last um, decade, most of the offshore banks operating within the region have disappeared because of a lack of corresponding banking. And as a consequence, they would have taken with them um, a number of jobs and, um, you know, they, they would have seen an increase in poverty. Uh, you'd find, for example, too, that, um, you know, these, um, uh, the, the, these banks, for example, in the past, they made um, loans and advances to, to governments to help with, um, you know, the development of the economy. They would have even made um, loans to um, private individuals for business purposes. So there has been a knock-on effect uh, by the disappearance of, um, of these banks. And again, it would have made our countries far more vulnerable in that, whereas in some instances, uh, offshore financial services would have contributed a few percentage and points to GDP. Uh, you know, it's virtually, virtually non-existent now. Uh, so I would say that um, those are some of the consequences that um, arose as a result of, um, you know, the curtailment of corresponding banking. Uh, maybe one of the good things oh, I'm out of it uh, from the, in, within the domestic space, we have seen... Um, a consolidation of banks and many of the small banks that ordinarily, you know, would have had difficulties surviving. They have now scaled up into bigger banks and, you know, they have great economies of scale. Uh, but then again, there's another risk to that too, because they have now become too big to fail. Yeah. Uh, but again, it has been an overall um, challenge for uh, Caribbean um, countries. And as I said, um, it would have impacted on employment, uh, uh, poverty, and, um, you know, even our capacity to, uh, government taxes um, and, and, and government's um, capacity to develop to deliver on um, certain, certain social services. Uh, Prime Minister, Martin, I want to. Uh, we have just a few more minutes. I want to bring in two questions that have been raised by some of our, our viewers, and I have a, a final question for you regarding the 2022 Summit of the Americas. Uh, but Andrew Ewart uh, raises the fact that number of the issues that we're, we've been discussing have been around for quite some for some time. Some of them. Uh, what is a what, what is a recommendation from your part? Is the 
uh, departing CARICOM chair, what a way forward to improve dialogue and to improve partnership. And, and I'll tie that then as well to a cop question from David Lewis, who as part of his question asked how the region can use nearshoring opportunities, especially with regard to FDI and services uh, to advance uh, uh, business opportunities and also those opportunities with the United States. Well, I'll take um, the last um, question first. And um, I have the view that um, the U.S. can get relatively cheap labor here in the Caribbean. And, um, you know, this um, hemisphere is a zone of peace. Uh, you have um, great stability within the region and perhaps some of those businesses um, that you would have had in other um, countries external of this um, hemisphere, it will make um, better business sense, even in terms of um, logistics and, um, and, and, and shipping, um, shipping logistics, uh, especially considering what is happening now with the type of um, logistics um, chaos that we've seen. Uh, the U.S. may want to consider moving some of those uh, businesses within the Caribbean region, and they will help us to obviously um, increase or improve our lot. Uh, we, would, we would benefit from an increase in economic activity and increase in employment, reduction in poverty. And uh, by so doing, the United States will be helping to contribute to the stability of the region, the economic stability of the region, and to uh, eliminate the possibility of um, you know, these um, uh, democracies becoming failed states uh, with all of the attendant um, crisis of um, um, let's say breakdown in the rule of law, breakdown in democracy, increase in crime and violence, narco trafficking, and so on, and even refugees, all of which could become problems of the U.S. Um, in the future. Uh, so um, I, I think that that could be a mutually beneficial arrangement um, for us um, here within the Caribbean. And insofar as um, the over, overall hemispheric um, relationship, uh, there's a need for us to continue to collaborate and to have um, institutionalized dialogue. As I recall, um, the last time that we had any real engagement with the U.S. president um, was a brief engagement with um, former President um, Barack Obama in um, Jamaica. And I can't even say that that was you know, really a substantive um, engagement. It was more perhaps a little courtesy call. But I believe that there should be um, serious and institutional, institutionalized dialogue between the Caribbean and the U.S. to discuss, um, you know, issues of um, mutual interest, hemispheric issues, issues of um, democracy and maintaining the rule of law, human rights and so on, uh, so that we can maintain this hemisphere as a zone of peace. And at the same time, to stimulate um, economic um, progress and development so that we can, um, you know, ensure that we have um, people who are, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, fully employed and to improve the living standards of all the people of the region. Uh, that will be an egalitarian um, policy that will uplift all and reduce um, the risk that I spoke about um, in which the region could be exploited by nefarious actors. And, um, you know, at the same time, you could end up with the displacement of people within the region who may have to come to your shows um, in seek of, um, you know, seeking um, opportunities for employment and a good living standard. Thank you so much, Mr. Purvis. Just a last quick question for you. Next year will be the Summit of the Americas. Uh, I know that this is a, it's an important gathering, and of course, an important gathering for Caribbean voices, something that we've uh, been very focused on here at the uh, Atlantic Council and the and the Adrian Arts Latin America and the Caribbean Initiative is elevating those uh, the the importance of, of Caribbean issues, Caribbean priorities as part of the summit process. Um, what, is, what from your perspective as as outgoing chair of Caricom, uh, what do you see as some of the ways in which uh, the U.S. can strengthen that partnership with the Caribbean in multilateral forums such as the summit? Well, you know, we all live in the same hemisphere, and we have um, common interests. Um, our security interests, for example. Um, you know, we have to ensure that um, we maintain our mutual um, security interests. And I have to admit that is one of the areas in which the U.S. would have um, shown um, interest during the last um, several decades. Um, but the other areas in which, uh, you know, we would like the United States to provide greater leadership. And, and, and I mean, we discussed many of them before. And even in terms of um, democracy, um, promoting a strong democratic agenda within the hemisphere, um, obviously to maintain the rule of law, to make sure that we have strong and um, healthy democracies in which um, you know, our people um, enjoy good living standards. As I said before, you know, if our people um, you know, are not doing well, we have high levels of unemployment, 
and our people cannot eat, then we cannot sustain our democracy. So the United States um, should also be um, looking at areas in which they can help to um, provide opportunities um, for people within the hemisphere so that um, all of us could um, grow and maintain good living standards and you know, to be proud um, within the space in which we live and operate and not to be in a position in which um, our spaces become so hard to live that we then have to think about uh, migrating even as refugees. So again, I think that, um, you know, this um, upcoming um, uh, forum in 2022, uh, these are some of the issues in which we need to get a full consensus and to develop an agenda to maintain this um, hemisphere, not only as a zone of peace, but perhaps one of the most um, uh, productive and one of, um, I'd say perhaps, um, you know, one of the best um, hemispheres hemispheres in the world um, that will be good for um, human living in which all of us can sustain, um, you know, a good standard of living. I know that's something that we're all, we're all focused on, making the uh, Western hemisphere and the Caribbean a fundamental part of it, one of the best or the best hemisphere, uh, let's say, in the, in the world's living. And, and I'm also pleased right. that the many indications that I've personally seen from the U.S. government on prioritizing the importance of Caribbean uh, voices and perspectives as part of the 2022 summit. And, and if I may just add quickly, you know, if you look at the collective wealth of this hemisphere, uh, North and South America, even the Caribbean region, uh, we have enough resources in which, um, you know, we can literally enhance the living standards of all. So with greater collaboration and greater collaboration, cooperation and collaboration, I'm pretty sure that we can achieve it. That's a great note to end on. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, uh, congratulations on your, uh, your chairmanship of, of CARICOM. I uh, want to thank you again for joining us for this Leaders of the Americas uh, event. And, and by uh, uh, thanking you, uh, thanking your ambassador, who I know has been listening, Melanie Chen has been listening, and, and Adrian Arce, the founder of the Adrian Arce Latin America Center, has been listening as well. Uh, so thank you again, and I want to wish you the uh, most uh, happiest of holiday seasons and look forward to seeing you in 2022. Thank you very much, Jason. Um, thank you, Melanie, and all the others. And I uh, wish you a Merry Christmas, and hopefully 2022 will be a great year for all of us. Thank you very much. Blessings to you all. Thank you, you too. Cheers.